I've been working my levels, like, slightly down every show. Because I see, Dwight, you, I can see your level right there. And it's like, all, how can we hear you at all? It's like all the way down there. Your gain. Well, I'll is tell you why. Uh, because I'm doing the NPR method, which is that I'm very, you. very close to the mic. Oh, speaking of which, speaking of which, I keep forgetting my pop filter. Get that pop filter going, bro. Uh, in fact, why don't, why don't I do the intro to the show in an NPR fashion? All right, let's okay. see. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. There's probably some like weird theme song that's you like gotta give us like the time esoteric too. jazz. Uh, the time. Well, right now I'm gonna do it in um, military time. Just no, no, I'll I'll do I'll do it regular. Okay. The time is 7:39 p.m. It is Friday, October 15th. Welcome back, everyone, to Eat the Rich. <laughs> it's a show about political economy, late stage capitalism. And the millionaires, billionaires, and multinational corporations hell-bent on staving off its death rattle. Uh, tonight, we have Shane. Hi! Oh. <laughs> uh, and we have Chris. Hello. And this episode, by the way, is brought to you, brought to you by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's brought to you by Deloitte, consulting for the digital age. In partnership with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, <laughs> who generously provided uh, security for this for this I'll, show. I'll tell you who's fucking sponsoring me tonight is Modelo. Hang on. Yeah, boy. Yeah. Oh, there it is. I was I was uh, telling you guys right before we started recording. I um last night I had a couple of uh, ciders. Uh, not 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 overboard. Certainly not for me. Um, and I usually, I usually don't indulge in the middle of the week, uh, cause uh, you know, I'm teaching and stuff, but this week it's fall break. So hey. I didn't, I didn't have to teach, uh, this morning. So last night, you know, at little like happy hour event and I was like, oh yeah, let me have a couple. I had a couple of pumpkin ciders, you know, um, kind of trying to bring in the fall season and, uh, you know, I got a little bit of tipsy, but, uh, not, not too out there. And then just all fucking day today, just like nauseous and sick and mm. I, I and i've been trying to figure out if it was the sugar uh if, if it was the fact that i didn't eat at all yesterday <laughs> before drinking that you know you know yeah, now, that, now, that, now that, that i don't now think you've been that it. part earlier yeah <laughs> it seems quite obvious i guess in my mind if you're drinking a cider that's equivalent to like a serving of fruit a cider a day keeps the doctor away uh, it's certainly how i have managed to stave off scurvy um, right. Because usually I don't have much citrus going on in my life. Um, Cheers, everybody, by the way. Yeah. And so I am I'm drinking at- it out of a glass again. That's I know you, you, it entertains you quite a bit, Chris. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll probably mm. be joining you fellas when we do the... Um- the main show after this, but right now I'm I'm still drinking a coffee I got at like uh, 10 a.m. Mama Mia! Mm. I, you know I've almost almost considered taking up coffee again and caffeine again. It astounds me that you don't. You have to. I I, 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 I really you couldn't. can't process. I've, well, it. I've been three years without it. That's, I every, guess con- congratulations. That, I don't yeah, know. What do you want? You see, <laughs> there's no way to say it without sounding like a smug prick. Like there's just no way to say it. But I, I don't mind. It's just at the time. It just wasn't serving me, and I was getting too jittery and anxious and shit like that. And I was just like, what the fuck is the point if, like, I'm just drinking it to not get a headache? You know what I'm saying? So, fuck it. Yeah. I drink it because it gives me a headache. I want (laughs) to experience displeasure at all hours. Today's programming is brought to you by Starbucks. (laughs) Proud opponents of, uh, what was your... Chris, what was your fucking uh, screen name at the time? Oh, Tony Muller Beast, Dad 19... 69. Oh, Muller Dad 60. That's right. <laughs> by the way, by the way, I um, found, um, I, was, I was like getting a new phone, but long story short, I had to um, like put, uh, put a SIM card in uh, an old phone that I still had to activate it. And it's like the iPhone 5 that I had when I like had that account. And when I like still had the Twitter app on it, and when I press the Twitter app, um, I'm still logged in as Muller Dad 69. No way. It's still like like the um the timeline is like frozen in time of that day. Like I can scroll <laughs> it and everything of like everything you know. Yeah. Um, it's it's like, I, I was talking about this the other day, and like just talking to a buddy about like you know doing the program and and thinking about Twitter in general and stuff, and like you know do are there any real world consequences to like the things that that we do and you know the things that we say on Twitter basically and uh and then i was like well actually now that i'm thinking about it we did um you know cause well you 
uh, Chris, caused uh, Starbucks PR to like literally reach out to Twitter and get you banned and then had to put out a statement saying whatever, no, you know, we don't discriminate <laughs> right <laughs> around right, the right, holidays right. against conservatives. <laughs> it's one of the funniest things. I just looked it up okay, again. Okay, let's, let's take a look. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> Starbucks Care. Oh, my Hel- God. Hello. Molodad69 is not an employee of Starbucks. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's classic that's fun but that's but fun that's how did they fun. and how did they know like i'm trying to remember like what the timeline was where it says because it says here and his account has been suspended due to impersonation yeah like how did they i remember at the time i was like wasn't it was like super close the timeline of like you getting banned and them putting out that tweet oh it was it was instant it was this 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 was right after because uh, it like kind of like bubbled up over a few days and then or like close to a week and then steve king um fell for it right and that's right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, and then immediate immediately i was banned so good man those were the days huh yeah that was fun you somebody brought you up (laughs) at like i was at like a holiday work party if you can remember when such a thing existed back in pre-pandemic times and somebody brought you up without realizing that like we did oh the goodness. show together <laughs> and they were like oh shane you're interested in like d- misinfo disinfo or whatever uh, have you heard about this <laughs> what do you <laughs> think of laugh. this sick freak <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i thought it was really funny i don't um, know this guy i don't associate <laughs> with him <laughs> i was proud to say yeah that's my friend love it that's man. my co-host that's my partner I it's- convinced him to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, t- I on my marching orders, he did it. My interest in misinformation is a practical one. It's such a shame that like uh, harassing brands has become so mainstream now, and I feel like they've they they're just like they're they're better at it. In fact, mm-hmm. one of one of my favorite interactions that I had that I was thinking about the other day. I wonder if I can get to it. Was one that I had with Poland Spring. Mm. Uh, do you remember that by any chance? Anyone? No, I'm trying. I'm trying to recall Vaguely? your spat. Vaguely, with, with uh, spring, and I can't. Okay, let's see. Uh, they had a tweet that this was August 2009. It was like, "Think cool thoughts in this heat with the crisp and refreshing taste of our 100% natural spring water, Poland Spring from the heart of Maine." And then I, I asked, I, I knew what I was doing. I was just being a jerk, like you know, just trolling, as it were. And I said, "Why don't the profits go to the citizens of Maine?" And again, you know, it's a pretty fucking basic analysis to say like, hey, you know, uh, what gives the right of some for-profit corporation to take, you know, the, the especially if they're like depleting the water table of Maine, like not that there's not plenty of water in the water table, it's well established, blah, 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 it's probably fine. But, uh, you know, why don't the profits go to the citizens of Maine? And I love, they wrote back, we are incredibly dedicated to the communities where we live and operate. <laughs> we work hand in hand with our communica- uh, communities and aim to only positively impact our local environment and economy. And this was my, their response to what I said next was incredible. They said, I said, yeah, but do you share your profits with the municipality from which you take the resources? And they said, good questions. Every year, we generate more than $21 million in tax and fee revenue for state and local Mm. governments. Mm. And we pay more than $49 million in annual salaries and benefits, which is like, you pay your taxes and you pay your employees. That's not remarkable. That's not yeah, at yeah. all like, you know, obviously responding to the analysis that we did. And then, you know, all of our friends came in and dragged them. It was fun. I want to do more than this. The, the, the peak bleakness of the Twitter brand thing for me came last week, and I don't think we talked about it. Um, but there was that like day that uh, like uh, Facebook went down and Instagram went yes. down for, you know, a number of hours. Yep. And, um, and then like Twitter... Like the official Twitter account was said, like "Hello, literally everyone," right? Mm-hmm. In all lowercase, right? Right. You, you know, and then and then all the brands, all the brands in. responded, yeah. oh, including right. like I, I did a screenshot of some of them. It was like Microsoft Teams, Bratz, the like dolls, <laughs> <laughs> um, Reddit, McDonald's, and then the one that really just like ruined me was the IDF. Oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> yeah, IDF. Did, what did they say? Do you have? If that? you need any help, IDF tech support is active and always ready to lend a hand. Yeah, Yikes. if you've got any children that need <laughs> to be ventilated, if you, if you have any Iranian uh, nuclear facilities that need uh, hacking, yeah, happy to yeah. help. 
It's really, it's really dark stuff, man. Yeah, it really is. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely, there was like a period where it kind of started a few years ago when a couple of the brands started doing the like depression posting stuff. I know Carrie talked about it oh, um, God. on her older show that she did, um, uh, JK, I'm fine. But, uh, you know, they, they talked about it a bit then, um. But now it's it's become so standard. It's like all of all of the brands are like kind of talking this sort of cutesy, you know, way. And yeah, you know, you realize like a lot of the people who are running those accounts are probably people our age or even younger. Yes. Um, yes. You know, and they're probably making like fucking next to nothing. Yes. Um, but uh, you know, it's still it's like oh, it's just so it's. I mean, it's just the classic turn of advertising and you can incorporate anything right like anything can be co-opted any manner of speech any aesthetic can be reinducted into a capitalist circuit you know where it's like you have fucking burger king <laughs> talking about being depressed or whatever it's just like i can't didn't one of them wasn't it burger king that did like a dep- like a, like an ad campaign for like depression meals or something yes oh yes, my yes, god yeah you're right. i remember that yeah oh, i'm looking that up real quick <laughs> depression meal Burger King is the latest brand to use depression as a marketing tool. Fuck! <laughs> Fuck! Dude! Yeah, it was, it was, it, yeah, here's one of the pictures. It was like, no one is happy all the time. And they had, like, different, like, kind of emotional states Dude, on the, the little, like, happy shame. meal boxes. Um, Dude, can you, I'm, I'm looking at these emotional states thing. I'm just going to yeah. read them here. Pissed meal. Yes meal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I have goosebumps from even just saying that. DGAF meal Mm -hmm. salty meal Mm -hmm. blue meal yeah yeah Uh, you know it's an unhappy meal which i mean i i i I think the only way i find that slightly acceptable right is like the brand if if the brand was fully like aware and just dropped any pretense and and it ceased to be like this is like a special like instead of doing that like this is a special cute marketing thing and the like the the logo and new slogan of burger king became like you are depressed because this world is awful and we provide shitty food for that period of Correct. time because i i like to eat at burger king when i'm depressed <laughs> you know, it, you know, like, like if it was just like we are the shitty burger company, <laughs> like it's yep. it, who gives a fuck, like, and and it was just like, yeah, you know, you're gonna die, <laughs> like if that was like like the and, and instead of giving children toys, it gave them little pamphlets that like you know explain death <laughs> in very detailed <laughs> ways, you know, and it was just like you're fucked, it's the, over. The, the motto should be. You're at the bottom of the barrel, and we'll meet you there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fucked up. Um, pretty, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty dark, uh, bleak, bleak times. I mean, I, I, it's a weird, it's a weird thing because it is in in contrast to like the like everything else, and I think it it is especially more salient now than ever. And maybe it's just like my own mood or whatever, but especially with like the ongoing pandemic and and the issues therein and just this kind of like slow sludge feeling like nothing works and everything's falling apart and you go and you like go to get a bag of chips at the store and it's like it's a party it's like i'm not eating these (laughs) chips because i'm excited or happy this is the misery situation there's no like there's no joy there's no pleasure in it and i and i and i don't and i feel affronted when a especially a food product is trying to sell me on pleasure it's just no no i'm sorry that's not the relationship we have and if i if you try to market yourself as happy to me or enjoyable not interested i want the thing that just says it's dog shit you know you want it what, and what? I, that that's what i would get what do you do you think it's like jubilant when i go in a gas station to buy flips <laughs> What are flips? Th- Shane. What's a flip? I, I also don't know what flips are. Chocolate covered pretzels? Oh, yeah. Okay. Damn. Now now we're talking my language. But I'm not in a good place when I'm buying now that. Now we're Z. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not in a good go. place when I'm buying that. I'm not yeah, buying sure. that for the right reasons. I'm buying those for the wrong reasons. I'm buying those shamefully. Yeah, shamefully you're Sh- buying That's them. right. Well, I think of you every time I have the treats yeah. and goodies. 
I, I, I was walking home from work uh, the other day, and I passed by a 7-Eleven, and I was like, I'm going to go in and get one of those fucking roller hot dog things. Shame, and no. I went oh, yeah. in. I like the I, burger. I, I, like the the cheese, I like the cheeseburger one. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and and <laughs> I went in, and I like got online, and I got to the counter, and I was like, you know, just like I filled with shame. I was like, <laughs> can I have one of the, you know, taquito things? And oh, the guy shame. was like, which one? And I just sighed. I was like, whatever, man. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. just get whichever is the closest and easiest one to get to. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, oh, just God, give no. it to me. You know, like you don't need to put it in a bag. Just oh, honestly, just open up the thing and let me stick my hand in. I'll take it. I'll give you five dollars, whatever, and I'll just sadly eat this in the parking lot outside of your store before coming home. Th- those yeah. those things are less uh, expensive than you think. If you wanted to buy one for your home, uh, for your home office, the roller. Yeah, yeah, you could definitely really, buy. really. I, I I don't want to get into it, but at one point I have purchased one uh, in college for like our little. Uh, office that we had for a job on campus oh now that's a good idea yeah no it was uh, very <laughs> integral yeah i could get like a little mini fridge and a little and then put like a, a bunch of hot plates and, and rollers on the top dr- of it the dream is to bring 7-eleven to you <laughs> yeah 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 you'll be okay dude. i could store my own gas <laughs> right next to the, the situation <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hell yeah 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 it just sounds safe Listen before uh, <laughs> before I get too drunk, I would love to uh, I would love to uh, talk about this uh, this character with you guys. Yeah, please. oh yeah, please, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. I, let, let's go. So I guess you know we're we're kind of in a in a in a gear here because similar to last year, excuse me, similar to last uh, week, I've been sitting on this like character, sitting on this like a uh, uh, thing that I've been dying to talk about with you guys um, for the like the entirety of the, the the show that we've been doing this and the. Guy that I want to cover tonight is um, it's some pretty dark shit. Uh, basically, it's a, a neo Nazi from South Africa. If you can believe that, like you know, South African politics and their oppression could actually get worse, uh, this is a very good example of it. The guy I want to talk about tonight is um, Eugene Terra Blanche. Eugene Terra Blanche. Um, he was a very bombastic, kind of boisterous um, f- voice of the hard right and the Afrikaner white supremacy movement in the in uh, South Africa, most notably in like the seventies through the eighties and the nineties, and you know towards the end of apartheid. And this was kind of like if, you know if you look at it from a, a larger point of view, like a you know the the vestige of like the hard right that's trying to stop you know, ending an apartheid rule, ending minority rule in the country and returning rule, um, you know, to to native black South Africans. And so I want to talk about this because uh, for a few reasons, one is, you know, I think it's important for us to understand and, you know, dissect how these hideous far right ethno nationalist movements, uh, you know, uh, operate, you know, what are the phenotypes that they present? Like, what what do they look like? How can we recognize them? Not that I don't think we're particularly all all of us, including everybody listening, isn't particularly a uh, stranger to it at fucking this point. But um, but also kind of relish in um, in uh, the the tail end of his life, I guess we could say. So I- I'm going to tell you a little bit about this guy, and we're going to dissect some of this. And 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 Shane and Chris, feel free to let's stop at any time, talk about something. And they've got a bunch of clips that I'd like to play too. Um, yeah, let's go. So Eugene Terra Blanche, I, I won't get into his his um, background all that much, but long story short, he was uh, born in by, the. By the, by the way, if I, I'm sorry if I may interrupt. I, I couldn't. I know you said you wanted to keep it a surprise. I couldn't help but look up a picture of him, and he looks like um, his. The picture on his Wikipedia yes. is like Bloodbath McGrath from. Wild Wild <laughs> West. I'm serious. That's the, that's Does he the, have like the little tin? I ear? wish. I wish he had the ear horn F- yeah, filled but, with <laughs> wax. He's, but that is the first image that conjures to my mind. When don't I scroll my ear. In fact, don't Google. even look at the don't even look at the last paragraph I, no, I'm stop, of the I'm intro. Stopping there. I'm stopping okay, there. I, okay, had to, I had to see him. I had to really kind of. Yeah, yeah, know. yeah. I mean, yeah. So uh, he and and we're gonna get into the aesthetics a bit because I think it's it's quite purposeful and like you know like I said like the phenotypes of what he looks like. Um, but basically, uh, you know, he was he he was born in a town called Fentersdorp, uh, in the uh, Transvaal. Transvaal. I'm gonna try to do like. As much kind of Afrikaner, uh, you know, accent and lingo as I can here, and it, it's bad as it may be. But um, he was a South African police member 
for a time, which again, if you can imagine in the fucking sixties and seventies as a, uh, you know, an apartheid, hardcore racist, uh, white Afrikaner, um, uh, you know, a police officer, I can only imagine what fucking hell he brought up, but he was, uh, just, just so you know, like the Afrikaners are white, um, uh, descendants of Europeans that had settled in the, uh, in, in South Africa for a variety of reasons, a lot of which are like religious reasons and much like, you know, the, uh, the uh, pilgrims had come to America seeking like religious freedom or whatever. Not super different. They were uh, very much descended from like Protestants and Calvinists, most notably. Like Dutch, right? Exactly. Dutch. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the, their the language. The Boers or whatever. The Boers, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Their language, Afrikaans, is pretty much Flemish. Uh, but it's, it's very, very close to modern day Dutch, but with, you know, it's. <laughs> I can't I don't know if I should say this but anyway I'll I'll, I'll keep going here. Um but a lot of their a lot of their descendants d- descendants and we're going to hear in one of the clips is like from Belgium and the Netherlands and France and uh Ireland, Scotland, that sort of thing. And uh his his background was no different. He was of French Huguenots. Uh back, you know, in the from in the 1700s mm-hmm. they had immigrated mm-hmm. down to or colonized, I should say, down into Southern Africa. But he was a, and, and there's no sense in hiding this, like a very kind of charismatic guy, and he was very much interested in getting into politics, getting into a movement. And so eventually he had started a far-right ethno-nationalist party called the AVB, excuse me, the AWB. And in Afrikaans, it's Afrikaner Vierstand Beweging. And he started it as like a secret society. And the idea is that they would do basically they kind of started off with like terror (laughs) in their in their Mm. uh, practice. And I'm going to read from something now, which to kind of paint a little bit about this This is a bit of a retrospective. But this is one of the acts of terror that put him on the map. I'm reading from a Guardian article from 2001. And the title of it is called South Africa's Past Catches Up With It. And it reads as such. It was a little more than 20 years ago. That a group again, so this would have been in the 80s, that a group of men in suits waving a bucket stormed onto the stage of the University of South Africa's lecture hall, pinned down Floors van Jarsveld, and tarred and feathered him. Van Jarsveld's crime was to question the myth of Afrikanerdom's holiest day, the Day of the Covenant. The historian asked how Afrikaners could claim that divine intervention enabled 471 Boers to defeat 15,000 Zulus at the Battle of Blood River when the whites had been slaughtered at a previous encounter between the two. Did God switch sides, he wondered? It was too much for Eugene Terra Blanche and his neo-Nazi Afrikaner resistance movement, the AWB, or Ave Bay. Almost no one in South Africa had heard of Terra Blanche until he led the charge to punish Van Jarsveld's heresy. After that, the AVB's ranks swelled. While the historian was shunned, White South Africa was much was far from ready to question the myths about God, race, and land that provided the deluded basis for atar- apartheid. Two decades later, the Day of the Covenant holiday has been consigned to a very tall scrap heap of discarded fictions once taken as history. But South Africa is grappling to decide with, uh, with what to replace them with. And so they go on here. And so th- this is an example. I-, I wanted to read this to give you like an understanding of like he did something very fucking violent which was like an anti-intellectual, uh, uh, crazy fucking thing to literally tar and feather mm-hmm. a professor on the lectern, like at a, at a prestigious university in South Africa. Um, this was not isolated to his kind of like acts of violence and terror. And so to kind of paint this picture, I'm going to, sh- I'm going to actually, because I fucking can't share a, a video on this thing, Shane, I'm going to ask you to play this. Yeah. Okay. And, and we're going to watch uh, and as we watch, I'm going to kind of like try to narrate a little bit and translate what we're seeing and what's happening um, and and translate as well what they're saying in Afrikaans. And this is a rally by Eugene Terra Blanche. And this is like a, a neo-fascist rally. Um, you want me to just play it from the beginning? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's uh, short enough. So I'm going to while we're watching this, I'm going to kind of narrate what's happening. Okay. All right. And I am hitting play now. So you're seeing guys in like very kind of uniformed khaki outfits. Yeah, this yeah. Is, I mean, they look like Nazis. Nazis. They're Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. looks like yeah. a Nazi yeah. rally. And they have like you know pseudo swastika flags. Yeah. Yes. 
Some kind of Nordic rune thing. Yeah. Yep. And a motorcade pulls up to this, you know, lecture hall. And out steps Eugene Terra Blanche. That's the best they could come up with. Yeah, they're just Sig Heiling. I mean, this exactly. is very clearly like a smaller scale attempt to do the old fashioned like Nuremberg rallies. Exactly. Yeah. So now they're walking into this lecture hall. And I'm going to narrate what he's saying, like the actual words that he's saying. But tell me if you hear in the background who he's maybe trying to emulate through his uh, speech. I wonder. I wonder, too. Yeah. I mean, I'd be very surprised if it's not the person we're all thinking of. Yes. I mean, where else are you going It's with Donald this? Trump. No one who lived here and was white had an easy time in this country. At Blokrans and Mordsprite, women and children were stabbed. Two white people skewered on one spear. As if on a safety pin. I'm not popular with liberals because the fact of the matter is 27,000 gravestones point to heaven and speak to God and to our people. Here are the dead victims of the British concentration camps. This is the country that the AWB claims. The land we are willing to die for. With gun in hand, we'll crush the ANC. The ANC is the African National Congress, Mandela's party. Make a stand with prayer. Make a stand with work and organization. Make a stand with your vote, with bullets and guns. Make a stand in God's name. You don't have the right to hand this land to the ANC communists. This is God's land, the promised land. They say the AVB speaks threatening language, yes. I threaten in the clearest language. Hands off the Boer's land. Thank you, Shane. That was yeah. nice and light. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, e impressions of this. I mean, firstly, he obviously is like, you know, he makes a point to be as charismatic a speaker as possible. He's trying to be like Hitler. Of let's just, let's yeah, just yeah, get yeah, it. Yeah, it's a very, I mean, it's a clear one-to-one -one I mean, everything from the aesthetics of what we just watched is like, like I said, it's a direct ripoff of the original Nazis. Correct. Yeah. So, like, look, obviously, and the, the aesthetics of it, you know, is very much, you know, not unlike the Afrikaners, uh, you know, the real kind of, like, rural Afrikaners try to, like, to dress, which is often in this, like, khaki garb. And, um, you know, it's it's often kind of tied to this idea, like, they're at war, they're at battle, like, they're an oppressed mm -hmm. group, especially post-apartheid after, you know, the end of, you know, minority rule, white minority rule. But the idea, especially, like, in that speech is... And this brings it up a lot is that he is disillusioned with liberalism, liberals that are like giving kind of like credence to the idea that, well, perhaps, you know, maybe this is a bad thing and maybe we need to hand over, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, relenting to the pressure of the uh, the ANC movement, which was not not untied from, uh, you know, Marxism. And this there was there was many like American newspapers lambasting Mandela at the time for being like a communist and like sure. a Marxist and shit. Sure. Uh, and it, it, he certainly did not have uh, the backing of the West like we like to look back now in revisionist history. But the idea is that, you know, it's communists that are coming to take over. I mean, this is, again, like textbook Hitler shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was interesting, I should mention, is that um after the incident where they tarred and feathered the uh, the professor von Jarsfeld, he applied for amnesty. And I'm I'm just reading here from like literally the 
Ministry of Justice or whatever in, in South Africa from a 1997 article, which just says, Neo-Nazi leader Eugene Terrablanche is to apply to South Africa's Truth Commission for amnesty for two acts of political thuggery by his supporters. Terrablanche, who leads the far-right Afrikaner resistance movement, told The Weekly he was taking the step to, quote, clear my name and to, quote, establish a clean record. One incident involves tarring and feathering University of Pretoria professor Fl- Flores van uh, Jarsfeld during a public meeting in 1979. Uh, van Jarsfeld, of course, you know, we explained the thing that they were trying, he was saying how ridiculous it is to say that the day of, you know, the, the, the kind of divine lore of the Battle of Blood River. Um, but also... The second incident Terra Blanche would on Monday apply for amnesty for is the so-called Battle of Ventersdorp, the AWV's farming town stronghold in the west of the country. This is the, the town that he was from when former President Frederick de Klerk visited it in 1991. De Klerk, and this was, of course, you know, the, the, the last white president of South Africa before the end of apartheid. De Klerk, regarded as a traitor by the AWV, was entering power-sharing negotiations when Mandela's formerly banned African National Congress, ordered by police to prevent AWV, AWB members from entering the public meeting, an action which incensed Tara Blanche and his supporters. Armed with tear gas, firearms, they t- attacked police and the ensuing chaos. Three people were killed and scores were injured. So again, now, this is all in the guise of him, like, uh, trying to apply for amnesty, uh, which is ridiculous. But, uh, you know, for him to apply for amnesty is pretty crazy. And now there's a clip from when uh, Louis Thro went to South Africa. Mm-hmm. And he, I don't know, you may have seen this. I- I'd be surprised if you hadn't. But I just want, uh, Shane, if you could just play a little bit of this clip here. It is not a matter of black and white, my friend. You really do not understand. Why? We are not Africans from Africa. We are white people, the descendants of the British and and the Irish and and the French people and the Dutch people. Mm. We are from Europe. You don't want me to rule those two Boer republics as the sole property of the Boer people. Look, can can I make a distinction? No, no, no. No, No, you ask me the question and I answer it. No, definitely no. My task is to defend my people against the ideas to destroy my people. Thanks for clearing that up. If I could recap, Christian God-fearing, accepts the elements, the weather, toughness, pride, patriotism of being a Boer, sense of history, Boer history, ideally should speak Afrikaans, not essentials. You work very hard to come to the last point. Yes. Must be white. Must be white. If we allow black people or non-white people to become Boer people, then it will be the end of the existence of the poor people because in South Africa alone we are only three and a half million against 40 million black people. This is an exciting new country, a democratic country. Exciting? Yes, South exciting. Africa. And well, it uh, seems uh, why, like... Why are you saying that? What is exciting? Exciting that the people who build the highways and the schools are not in the, in the government anymore. Is that exciting? The yeah, downfall, yeah. See, the like downfall, Mr. Teflon, I feel as though you're lecturing you can pause it there, it's exciting can we? Okay. <laughs> it's so, I li- obviously, Louis Thoreau is like, has like some hilarious, like British uh, d- demure attitude about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and also like he's using kind of like the liberal kind of ideas saying like, hey, let's point out the ridiculousness of your argument when, you know, he's standing in front of what was, you know, one of the most prolific fascists of uh, in South African history, in modern history, at least. Uh, if I could just ask you, Shane, to just go to the four minutes and 45 seconds, just the tail end of it. I just love the way that uh, he tries to, like, be a fucking boor about it and shake his hand. Put off that camera, the camera okay. on my well, can we just Can I just shake hands and say, thank you very much. You have a firm handshake. We're supposed to... Oh, that's... Oh, that's what what that's am I? Why are you squeezing it so hard? Am I not a man? Yeah. <laughs> Meaning? That's, am I that's... not a man? Is that Shakespeare? Go ahead, Chris. That's like ridiculous, like Donald Trump style. Yes. Like, like out of like an 80s, like yes. business 101 book or something. Like just like that just ridiculously hard handshake. Yeah. To, to yeah. attempt, like squeeze the fingers and like attempt to it, it's hurt them. Such, like it's a it's tough like, thing. It's like something you do like when you're fucking like 17 and you're like <laughs> full of testosterone. And you're like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to show him what a man I am. And you're just shaking his hand quietly, but like squeezing really hard. It's a dumb guy. 
yeah, like yeah, way of yeah. like trying Ma- to like assert pseudo masculinity bullshit. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Now I, I want to play one last video before we go to uh, to the to the next part of this, which I thought to be very interesting. Again, you know, because the idea is for him to be like I don't know, super like. I'm trying to even like find the words for it. Like super prolific, super masculine, super like the point for him is to be like this kind of like aesthetic figurehead for the white boor South African. And uh, this is just a ridiculous video where you just watch him on horseback try to be like prolific and powerful. It's him on horseback. <laughs> I mean, he's just like a sad old man on a horse. <laughs> it's not impressive. He's a big but boy, too. So that... man die better facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods. There he goes. <laughs> now, this was him on his farm in Fentersdorp. And I'm going to, I want to, to reveal this to you uh, at the same time. So I'm going pre- to put this in the chat. And okay. I would like for all, for all of us to uh, read the headline at the same time. Okay. I think you'll enjoy <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's so, it's so good, dude. It's so good. It is so, so good. So uh, to the listener, how did he end his life? Well, it was in 2010, and I will read The Guardian uh, headline. It says, White supremacist Eugene Terra Blanche is hacked to death <laughs> after <laughs> row with farm workers. <laughs> and it's actually really fucked up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this here, and it's quite wild. It says, a, no- a notorious white supremacist who once threatened to wage war rather than allow black rule in South Africa was hacked to death at his farm yesterday following an argument with two employees. Eugene Terra Blanche's mutilated body was found on his mm-hmm. bed along with a broad blade knife and a wooden club, police said. He was hacked to death while he was taking a nap. One family friend who wished not to be named told Reuters. Uh, local media quoted a member of Terra Blanche's AV, uh, AWB party as saying that the 69-year-old had been beaten with pipes and machetes. Uh, people say <laughs> two males thought to be workers on the farm have been arrested and will appear, appear in court on Tuesday. And I fucking hate when they lionize these pricks, but it says, Tara Blanche with striking blue eyes uh, and white beard. Uh, why? <laughs> why? Why do this? Why? why He's do not, this? It's not striking. He looks like shit. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing interesting or notable about the, the way he looks. He looks like a sad old man. came into my mind when I saw him was the earwax horn guy. He looks, yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks like a, uh, he looks like, um, like a, a cocaine abusive Michael McDonald. Like, just very, like, you know, with the blue eyes and the white uh, beard. Anyway, it says, it says, uh, you know, he was the voice of hardline oppression to the end of racial apartheid in the 1990s. Anyway, now I want to, to, to raise something else here. I mean, firstly, let's just get this out of the way. That's fucking awesome. That's, that's cool as shit. And, and what it, what it eventually says is like, you know, the idea was that they were killed because they were unpaid. It, it continues here. It says police in South Africa's Northwest province said last night that Terra Blanche had been attacked and killed at his farm 10 kilometers outside Fentersdorp. Captain Adele Myberg said Terra Blanche was attacked by a man and a miner who worked for him after they had alleg- allegedly had an argument about unpaid wages around 6 PM. Uh, it's so good. And now this is, this is interesting too. It says the opposition democratic Alliance, which is a, Kind of like a smaller political party in South Africa, which is kind of like they're kind of doing the like, you know, Democrat sort of like liberal, like center left sort of thing. They say they expressed outrage and concern at Tara Blanche's murder and cited the, the recent controversy controversy triggered by Malema, which I'm going to explain in a second. But like the fact that they're just like, this is outrageous that this hideous fucking psycho terrorist neo-Nazi was hacked to death. <laughs> in his own house that's objectively a good thing the problem is solved like there's this is this is a good thing and in fact uh i just want to play i'm sorry last last thing i'd like to play which is this um the 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 uh al jazeera report from his funeral black south africans were asked to remain in the poor township area and not attend terra blanche's funeral for security reasons heavy police presence made sure skirmishes between blacks and whites didn't happen on friday but Terra Blanche's party, the AWB, has threatened to take out their anger on blacks in the country, 
a threat some living here in Fentersdorp aren't taking lightly. I'm worried. I'm worried, but we are ready. Let so me cool. say we are ready for them. They must come to, yeah, for revenge, but we are ready yes. for them. Black South Africans are the poorest in this town, and years of being oppressed by whites during apartheid leave some with little sympathy for Terra Blanche. Many years he was killing people, killing people, only blacks. Why he don't? Why he didn't kill whites? He was just killing uh, black people. The two accused of brutally murdering Terra Blanche will appear in court Wednesday, but it could take weeks or even months before a verdict is reached. During the apartheid years, Fentersdorp was a hotspot. Atrocities were committed by both the blacks and the whites. If investigations into Eugene Terra Blanche's murder aren't handled quickly and sensitively, there is a fear that the different races here will only grow further apart. Harumutasa Al Jazeera, Fentersdorp. South Africa. And it's interesting. I, I saw another uh, kind of like news coverage of the funeral where there was a, a, a South African, excuse me, an Afrikaner guy that was just like, I mean, depressed, like visibly heartbroken at the, the news of this guy dying. And he was like, you know, we don't know if there's going to be another leader of the Afrikaner movement. Time will tell. And so like, you know, it's this, this in the, in this case was like a particularly good example of like taking out a figurehead and making like a lasting difference by doing so. Now, the the previously mentioned in the Guardian article controversy over this gentleman named Julius Julius Malema. Julius Malema is a millennial. In fact, he's he was born in 1981, and he is the president and commander in chief of the Economic Freedom Fighters, and they are the largest Marxist uh, party in South Africa. And at the time uh, that they were of course, talking about this, this was like 2010, Julius Malema was coming under fire, and he was at the time like kind of being pushed out of the ANC, the African National Congress. This was Mandela's party. And he was at the time um, like the head of the youth uh, organization, like the, the Youth League of ANC. And he put forward a song and dance, which I would like to play for you, called, uh, it's a little... It's a little uh, uh, subtle. It's called Kill the Boer. <laughs> and uh, if I may, Shane, uh, just sorry, one more, uh, one yeah, more sure, video sure. here. And I'll, I'll narrate, because it's kind of hard to hear in this audio, but I'll just narrate what they're saying. There's a graffiti that says, disarm the police and kill the Boers. Here is a message message from Joe Slovo. Comrade units survive. Street committees survive. Kill the Boers, our father. Kill the Boers, young man. Communist Party, victory. Joe Slovo, our father, life in exile, Tambo in exile, these are famous black leaders in South Africa. So, that, that's, that's fine, Shane. Okay. It just uh, occurred so, to me, this, this, doesn't Terra Blanche literally mean white land? Is that his yes, given name? Or did yes, he... No, that's his him, name. That's his given birth name? That's his given birth name, yes. Yes, it is. Wow. Um, I should mention, I should mention that the, uh, the guy who was, I think we've, we've mentioned this, um, you know, what happened to the guys that fucking sliced this guy to pieces? <laughs> uh, and uh, the trials concluded in 2012, and the older farm worker was uh, charged with murder. I'm going to read this here from The Independent. It says, A 29-year-old black farm worker has been found guilty of murdering the white supremacist Eugene Terra Blanche in 2010, a killing which had sparked fears of a return to early post-apartheid racial tensions in South Africa. Outside the high court in the northwest farming town of Fentersdorp, police had set up cordons and to separate supporters of the farm worker and his accomplice and about 60 members of Terra Blanche's Afrikaner, you know, the, the AWV. And they were dressed in military-style fatigues, holding their red, white, and black swastika-style flag. Judge John Horn, who said a wage dispute had been uh, at the center of the murder, 
found the farm worker, and I think I can pronounce the last name. His name is Chris Machangu, guilty of murder. I think the H and the L is that kind of like <laughs> sound. He acquitted the second man, Patrick Nedlovu, 18 years old, of murder and attempted robbery. And he, he was like 16 at the time that he was involved, allegedly involved in this. It says Nedlovu, who was a minor at the time of the murder, was instead found guilty of housebreaking. Both men would be sentenced. Anyway, so I just wanted to, to, to uh, oh God, and it gets so, it's, it's very fucking bad here. If I, if I may say this too, it says, Judge Horn dismissed Mashlangu's claim that he had acted in self-defense. The judge said Nedlovu was a passive bystander and there was no evidence Tara Blanche was killed due to his political views, but that the dispute was purely over wages, although I can't imagine that there wasn't any bad blood just straight up out there. While Tara Blanche was portrayed as arrogant and violent, neither of the two accused testified about these alleged character traits or claimed any abuse. However, Judge Horn, and this is pretty fucking gruesome, Judge Horn also rejected claims made by the defense during the trial that Tara Blanche had sodomized Matlangu. Sodomy is such a personal intrusion. I can't believe he would have not have raised it immediately in the police statement, Judge Horn said. The judge said that Matlangu had seen the semen-like fluid on Tara Blanche's genitals as an opportunity to use so- sodomy as a defense, but the police never proved that the fluid had been semen. Fuck, it's just, it's just fucking... This guy... Is just sick and heartbreaking. Whether or not it was true, it's just it's disgusting that they even have to like put this into question. I mean, the guy is a fucking neo-Nazi. Like the the, the idea yeah. that he was like anyway, it's it's pretty fucking intense either way. So that's Eugene Terra Blanche, folks. What do you think? Oh, uh, he's dead. Not a fan. <laughs> Not a fan. <laughs> yeah. It's cool that he's dead. That part is yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, d- d- thumbs down from me. Yeah, uh, totally, totally yeah. agree. Totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Zero out of ten. Yeah. Again, it's <laughs> it would just be my rating. <laughs> it's just so funny. Like, it's heartbreaking that like the the template for the white supremacy, everything down to like the fucking logo, is out there. I mean, the guy, you know, he was born during World War II and he he grew up just after it. But you know, that entire template was there that he pretty much copied one for one from his like mm. rhetoric and his uh, you know his style and even just like you know the way that they conduct themselves as like stormtroopers while out on the street yeah yeah. there was in fact a uh there was a song let me just get it up here there was a song that had come out by the afrikaner artist buck van bleuk about this general uh, a a south african general named uh de la ray and the idea was like this this song had come out in um 2006 before terra blanche was was killed and I, I, I think I remember seeing somewhere that like Afrikaners were like when this song came out, which was about like Afrikaner pushing away the, um, you know, the, the British, which in fairness, during the Anglo-Boer War, there was there was concentration camps for uh, for Afrikaners that the British had done. And so this song like ignited this kind of like the reignited this kind of ethno-nationalist um, feeling among the Afrikaners, uh, among some of them, at least certainly the uh, farther right ones, to say like, hey, we're going to fucking return to our militant roots and we're going to fucking, you know, take this back or whatever. Obviously went nowhere and the leader of the far right of the Afrikaners was hacked to fucking death no longer than four years later. Um, but I, I just, I find it interesting as well that, and he, he, he said as much in that speech that we had played earlier during that rally, that like, you know, we will fight off oppression and we, and the 27,000 graves in the, the people, the, you know, the, the Afrikaner casualties in the Anglo-Boer War, you know, those will, those gravestones are pointed towards God. And, you know, this, this comes from like this divine thought that like, you know, they are the divine and, and God, it is God's will that they want to be like minority oppressors. But I just find it interesting, like the tool used by white supremacy that like they take oppression by the British, by fellow white people, and say, we're going to use that as justification towards oppression towards black people, people indigenous to fucking southern, to South Africa. Like, I just find that to be a, a, a really interesting, like, obvious bullshit excavation of that, like, argument that they just use against, you know, other, um, that, that, you know, they were oppressed by other white people. I mean, that's the classic like Nazi move, right? Is yeah. to claim minority status and be like, we're the true minorities, right? We're the ones who are being oppressed. I mean, it's a really perverse reversal, especially in the context of South Africa, where it's like literally a colonial state, yep. right? Like, yep. um, 
But uh, yeah, I mean, that's the classic move always. Um, you know, interest a little interesting thing here that uh, uh, that came to mind when we were watching that rally was, um, you know, they're wearing like these, like you were saying, these sort of like khaki uniforms, which were obviously to look like the Nazi brown shirts. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason why the Nazis were the had the brown shirts like what why that was like the choice of uniform for the stormtroopers is like when they formed the um the stormtrooper uh like paramilitary wing of the uh of their party um they were they were looking to buy military uniforms and the ones that they could get really cheaply in surplus were the german colonial uniforms because the germany had lost all of its colonies at the end of the first world war so like the you know first of all it's like a cheap move it's like that's what we could just buy but there's another you know it's again like the sort of circular link of colonialism yes. right and the logic of it right then and then later you know that becomes this like symbolic thing and obviously you know, in the context of the British, right? Their their colonial uniforms are also these kind of like khaki brown yes. um, things. So it's you know, it's all it's all interlinked. Um, what a fucking I, joke! In in that Louis Theroux documentary too, I remember one of the other um, people that he um, he ends up like meeting or or, or uh, interviewing very briefly, and, and it may have been it's been a number of years since I saw that particular piece, but I, he it may have been during like a rally. That um, mm. Tara Blanche was like doing or something. I think you're right. There was like a guy in attendance who was a uh, like an old Luftwaffe officer who had basically fled to the, like the, the you know whatever the board thing. But he was like you know at that time you know when they whatever they made that documentary in the nineties um, you know the guy was like. 90 or whatever and like barely coherent but he was we- proudly wearing his like you know world war ii luftwaffe uniform and everybody oh was like congratulating him and stuff and he was just you know fucking obviously like dementia riddled <laughs> and like just sitting there um yeah another little fun another little fun bit of history yikes yeah yikes uh well there you have it folks not a good not a good look not a not a great look not a great you look know. at all it, it, not enough about the look. I mean, she, she fucking, it's hot in South Africa, and they're wearing khaki, like you know, on their no undershirt or anything like that. Mm-hmm. They've got to be fucking uncomfortable too. <laughs> like, come on, shit is hard. Anyway, we'll talk more about fabric uh, next week. <laughs> All right, folks, is that it for now? Yeah, I'll do it. All right, till next time. Good night. Uh, before we go, a message from our sponsors. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, uh, khakis. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't know a clothing company. So it's, it's so time detached. to pay the bills, guys. Time to pay the uh, bill, bills. Uh, do you guys like Dockers? Uh, y- yeah, John, I love Dockers. Yeah, I like uh, I, I like them on the weekends too. Sometimes I wear them when I'm uh, taking a walk along the uh, the in Jefferson Memorial. Yeah, I like uh, I like Dockers too. Um, did you know that it was actually the uh, the uniform of choice for the uh, neo Nazi AVB party in? Uh, <laughs> in- <laughs> uh, no, I didn't know that, John. Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. So uh, we're uh, Dockers. Uh, wear the brown shirts. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Goodbye. Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> Transfer. De la ra-